My name is Brad, and I'm one of the pastors here. If this is your first time, we say welcome to you. Um, if you did not take an envelope and you are in need of an envelope and for some reason you didn't take one, we will have elders at the front after service, and you can go talk to one of them, and they'll be able to give you an envelope because we want to make sure that we're able to meet a need for you if that's possible. And so today we begin a brand new series called Overflow. And the title we have with Overflow, it's A Life Refreshed by Generosity. And so over the next few weeks, we are going to unpack what it means to live a whole life generosity. Now, you might be sitting back and you might be thinking, well, what does whole life generosity mean? Thank you, Jonas. You might sit back, what, what are you talking about this whole life generosity? And so I'm going to have a definition for you right here on the screens. And this is what whole life generosity is all about. It is an overflowing way of being and living rooted in a vibrant relationship with God that gratefully releases all in love to bless who? Notice it doesn't say to bless me, right? To bless others. It's what God does, and it's how we want to live. In other words, our lives should be an overflow, and someone stated it this way, overflow, a life refreshed by generosity as we receive the blessings and gifts of God and then pour them into others. In this series, we're going to unpack the tools necessary for each of us to live out whole life generosity. In today's message, you'll see that the title of it is called Welcome Home. And so on March 22nd, my wife and I, God was able to give us a blessing where we purchased our very first home. And so I have a picture of, of Kelly up here and myself. And uh, for the last nine years, my wife and I had always rented. No matter where we lived, we rented, and it was not a home that we could call our very own. And so for the first time, we understood what it meant to be a home owner. That's eye-opening, shocking, because all the expenses are our problems, lots of them. We bought an older home, and so there was like things that we have to do and regular maintenance that comes with all that, and if something breaks, we got to fix it. It's on us and our bank account, as much as our bank account cries every time that happens. But we don't mind doing those things. Why? Because the home is ours. And so anytime that we have to go and fix something, I'm not a plumber and I had to do plumbing within the first week of moving in. Mark Metcalf is like, take this part, take this tool, cut this, do this, put this on, and you're good to go. I had to FaceTime him like 99 times that day, but we made it through. And I enjoyed it though. Those are things because it's, I look at it it's like, man, we own this. We own everything. We own the blades of grass that are poking through. We own even the weeds that are in our yard. Like those are our weeds. Like this is amazing. And there's just this different mentality that I never had growing up and never had when I rented because this place is actually ours. And we had the pleasure of moving in on a Saturday and not let, and just a little more than 24 hours later, we come home from church and our AC's broken. Yeah! And I think it was Kelly's mom's like, welcome to home ownership. And we're like, man, I guess we're getting broken in pretty quick. And so thankfully, it was just a lizard, touched a capacitor and fried the lizard and the capacitor, $30 fix, but we got it going. And so this new appreciation for us has really sunk in. And I remember as a kid, my parents telling me, go mow the grass, and I would hate my life for the entire two hours of doing that. They would tell me, go clean the pool, and I would hate my life for doing that. And those were things that I didn't enjoy until now, owning a home, I go out, I look forward to mowing the grass. And I'm like, what world do I live in, Kelly, where I enjoy doing chores? Like, what is this? And what it is, is because I've understood the importance of being an owner of our home, where before I was just a renter. And it was a huge paradigm shift for Kelly and I. And as a renter, you don't have to own many of the problems. If your plumbing breaks, call the landlord. If the AC breaks, hey, landlord, your AC's broken, right? If there's a leak in the roof, hey, landlord, you got a leak in your roof. And then the landlord comes up with the solutions, they tell you what to do, and then your life gets back to normal. 
And so there is a difference between being a renter and an owner. That's why how many of you would ever buy a rental car after it's been used by a rental company? Why is no one raising your hands? Why? Because when it's not yours, you really don't take care of it. We're going to test drive and drive this thing's crazy. We're going to burn. We're going to do things because it's not ours. We don't own it. And when you don't own it, you don't treat it the same. You might be saying, Brad, why are you talking about home ownership at church and being a renter at church? Because here's what God has shown me is that we have renters and we have owners at Hollywood Community Church. I've been a renter at many points in my Christian life. But God doesn't want us to be renters of Hollywood Community Church. He wants us to be homeowners and to own our church home, to own our church family. And every Christian who calls HCC home, it's your responsibility and my responsibility to own our church family, not anybody else's responsibility. You see, for many times in our life, we come to church each and every single week, we hang out, we worship, we rent the seat, we leave, but we forget about the most important thing that is inside of these four walls. And it has nothing to do with the carpet, the ceiling, the lights, the instruments, the songs that are sung. The most important thing in this room are the people, our family. People are the most important thing in this building. But see, this is how our renter mentality plays out. We're renters when we complain our favorite song wasn't sung while there's a single mom worried about how she's going to put food on the table and doesn't know. We're renters when we complain that, why don't we just give away stuff that other churches give away? But yet there's a widow who can't take care of her own yard and grass and it's growing out of control and she's getting citation after citation and she can't pay for somebody to come out and do it. And she's struggling. Or we sit next to the same people each and every single week but we don't even know their name or what they do for a living. Or we look at people and we say, man, they dress funny, they don't dress like us. And so we look down on them because the way that they dress but then there's a family that's upside down on their finances and first of the month is just a few days away and they don't know how they're going to make their rent or their mortgage. It's a renter mentality. Or we see somebody that needs a financial need, but we say, hey, HCC, Hollywood Community Church, you're the landlord of this church. Take care of their finances for them. But there's a dad whose car is broken down and can't pay to get it fixed and so he's probably going to lose his job and not be able to take care of his kids. And we pass the responsibility on to someone else. You see, renters in a church family are only concerned about their needs being met. Well, I got bills, and I got things due, and it's all about me. And then we let these people suffer in our church family and make them fend for themselves and leave them all alone. You see, God is not calling us to be renters of this church. God is calling us to be owners. He is calling us to own the pain of those in our church family and to live whole life generosity within our church family. And so in today's passage, we're gonna allow God to transform us into owners and I put it in my notes this way that here's the main thought for today. Generosity begins in the home. And by home, I mean this church home, this church family, Hollywood Community Church that you call home. And we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, so if you want to turn there, go ahead and open your Bible to there. And as, uh, as you're doing that, I'm just going to set the context for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul directs the Corinthian church, doesn't command, directs them and says, look, there are some poor Christians who are living in Jerusalem. And most of the time, many people that were living in Jerusalem that were Christians were very poor. Many of them had moved there to be in Jerusalem, to be back in this place that was their own, and they didn't have nothing. They were underneath the Roman Empire oppression and all these things, and so many of them were very, very poor. Destitute is the word that some, some scholars have used to describe this scenario. And Paul said, look, it is our responsibility, since you guys are well off, Corinthians, since you have an abundance in your resources, since God has blessed you with wealth, we're going to take up a, a collection each and every single week. And then when I return, I'm going to take that gift that you guys have collected, and I'm going to bring it to the poor saints in Jerusalem so that they will not have financial needs, so that they will be able to have their needs met. And so the Corinthians started out, they're 
collecting, they're giving, they're doing all this. They had so much energy. They're like, yeah, let's go. Let's give money to these people in Jerusalem. But then something happened. They became worried about their own financial needs. They became worried about, well, what is going to happen to us? Why do we have to constantly give? And so they stopped giving towards this gift. Paul finds out about it. And then he writes back to them, and he doesn't command them, and he doesn't say, you must give because God says so. He appeals to them in a way that is going to test their faith, their genuine faith in Jesus Christ. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 8. It says this, I say this not as a command to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. We're gonna stop with that verse for right now. What does he mean that he's going to test them or prove that their love also is genuine? Here's what Paul is getting at. Paul knows and he is hopeful that these Corinthian people are going to continue to give towards that gift. They will be able to do it. They will fulfill their commitment that they eagerly started. Even though they stopped, he is hopeful that they will continue it for one reason. Because he knows that they were born again. The word genuine means to be born. And he knows that if they've truly been followers of Jesus Christ, if God has truly changed their heart, they won't stop giving when they realize they should. They won't give that up. Out of their love for God and God's love for them, they would continue to give this gift. So he says, I'm going to prove it because I know your love is genuine. I know you've been born of God. And if you've been born of God, you won't ignore the responsibility of your brothers and sisters in Christ. So he says, I'm going to prove that you guys do this. He doesn't give it as a command. He says, I'm going to use love as the compelling force for you to continue to give. You ever been commanded to do something? Have you ever been commanded to give? I've been at a place where they, you must give! And you know what it made me want to do? I will not! But when God compels you out of his grace and his love, we do it willingly, we do it cheerfully, because it's love for God, and God gives us a love for others, and that moves us to give up our resources, to give up our finances, to meet somebody else's need. And this is what Paul is getting at, saying, I want to prove that your love also is genuine. And he's hopeful, and today I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that God can do that for me, and I'm hopeful that God can do it in you, and I'm hopeful in you this morning. Look at what verse 9 says. Paul goes on and says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet for your sake, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became, what does that say? Poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become what? Rich. Let that sink in for a second. Jesus, who was rich, became poor for a reason, not for himself. He became poor so that you might become rich. Look at what he says in verse 10. And in this matter I give my judgment. This benefits you who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. See, Paul gives the example of Jesus as motivation to continue to give. And verse 9 is a beautiful passage, is it not? Jesus goes from rich to poor, so we could go from poor to rich. And he does it out of love, not because we've earned it, not because we deserved it, But out of his grace and mercy, he was willing to become poor so we could become rich in him. And this is such a beautiful passage, but you would expect to find this passage 
in the Bible where it's talking all about who Jesus is and what it meant for him to become poor and what it meant when he accomplished that, being poor and then becoming rich, you would expect to find that in a passage that's talking all about that and asking all those questions. But where you find this beautiful passage is where Paul's saying you need to continue to give to the poor saints in Jerusalem. Why? Because he wants us to follow Jesus' example when it comes to taking care of the family of God. And what does it look like to take care of the family of God? Looks like Jesus. Jesus had the splendor of heaven. All things were created through him, in him and through him, and he keeping everything together. Worthy of all glory and honor and splendor and majesty. And he looked at us, stuck in our brokenness, stuck in our sin, condemned to die. And out of love, he said, I'm going to do something to break them free. I'm going to become poor. I'm going to humble myself so that these people, my creation, people made in my image, could become rich in my salvation, rich in my grace, and they would inherit the kingdom of heaven. You see, the Apostle Paul says it this way in Philippians 2, that Jesus became poor, yes, by becoming a human. He became poor because when he lived on the earth, he didn't come as a king. He didn't live in a royal palace, right? He was a son of a carpenter. He was living under mediocre means, but he also was poor in this sense, that he was obedient to the Father's will. Look what Paul says in Philippians 2.6, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus is the example for us today. Why do I need to give to my brothers and sisters in Christ? Why do I need to help meet a financial need that they might have? Because Jesus did that for us. He became poor so that we could become rich. And he was obedient to obey the Father's will, even when that meant his own death on the cross. And Jesus is calling us to have the same love for our brothers and sisters. And he wanted the Corinthians to remember, this is how you need to treat those saints in Jerusalem. Don't stop giving towards that gift. Jesus didn't stop his mission, did he? He didn't start it off strong, do miracles, go out and begin to change people's lives and then halfway get, ah, you know what? They're not really showing me love and respect. People really aren't holding up their deal of the bargain. They're really not working hard enough for me to continue to give them my love. Or whatever excuse we come up with to not help people out. Jesus was obedient to do what the Father's will was, which is for him to give his life as a ransom for many so that we would have salvation in him. And God is calling us to do the same with our giving towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, Jesus and the Corinthians had forgotten about who their true family was. And I think in times we forget about who our true family is. We look at it and it says, it's my mom, my dad, my brothers, my sisters, it's my kids, it's my immediate family, this little five circle right here, and this is my family and we're just gonna do our family. But Jesus redefined what family is. There's a new family on God's earth. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew 12, 48. He says, but he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hands towards his disciples, he said, here is my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Did you catch that? Who's God's family? 
It's anybody who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ. This is not a metaphor. It's not an analogy. It's not something that, oh, it just sounds cool. We are the family of God. It's not, well, it's blood only. No, you have faith in Jesus Christ. You are the family of God. And as the family of God, as we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we have to own that relationship. We have to own the pain of those suffering financially in our church. This is what family is all about. And this is why we can say when we gather together for worship on Sundays, we can look at each other and truly say, welcome home. Because we are family, a part of God's family. Generosity begins in the home, and it begins with each of us owning that responsibility. And here's what happens. Many times we minimize taking care of the people in our church because we say the community is the most important. Community is important. But church, if we can't take care of our home, no wonder we can't make a dent in the community. Are you with me? And the watching world watches how hypocritically we walk into our church buildings and leave, but we don't really take care of the people within our church. And there are people, first of the month, it's two days away, and there are people in this room freaking out with anxiety because they are financial needs that they can't figure out and don't know what to do about, and we who have an abundance, can do something about it. And because the watching world is watching, here's what Jesus says in John 13. A new commandment I give to you, that you what? That you what? Mm -hmm. Just as I have loved you. Not just love in the way that Brad wants to love people, because the way that Brad wants to love people is selfish. It's on Brad's terms, according to what Brad thinks other people should do to reciprocate. That's not what Jesus says. I want you to love one another the way that I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And then verse 35, catch this. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He's not talking about love between me and for the person in the community who doesn't know Jesus. This is love for the people of the family of God. That by the way that we love each other and care for one another is a testimony to the watching world. Because when we really truly begin to take care of each other's needs, it's not going to make sense for the watching world. It's going to make them think that something is wrong with us. I mean, think about it. Anybody who's been in the world, if they hear, I am going to become poor so that my other church family can become rich, that's nonsense. Right? The world's wisdom is get as much money as you can. Do you so you can take care of you and you can take care of the kids underneath you so that you can give money to your family for generations to come. Just keep all of your money for yourself. That's the world's dream. But Jesus says, I want you to become poor so that others might become rich. It's nonsense for people that don't know Christ. And they say, that sounds like some kind of weird socialism, Brad. And we don't like this socialism idea. Socialism is not what this is. We're looking at the word of God. And the word of God is saying, this is what love really looks like. This is how the kingdom of God operates. Socialism, that's a government thing. Pastor Brian mentioned that. The government is doing things the churches should be doing. The kingdom of God, this is what it looks like. We meet the needs of one another. We're not putting stipulations on that. We're saying, hey, you have a need and I can meet it. I'm going to meet that need because that's what God has done for me, met me at my greatest need, and we should do the same. And this is why the church leadership here said we're going to do a reverse offering. For too long, we've ignored the needs of people within our church. And we have to start caring for our flock. We have to start taking care of the sheep so that then when our needs are met, We can engage the community 
Because we're able to take care of the house of God, we can go out and do a greater work because we're all bearing responsibility for our church family. Now, because we did the reverse offering, it doesn't mean that we're done as a church family. It doesn't mean that no one else in the church has to do anything else. Each of us have to continue to live this out. And some might say, Brad, I just, I got to give an objection here. I've worked hard for my money. And what sense does it make for me to become poor while everybody else around me gets rich? I've had that mentality before, and it's a renter mentality. Because first of all, it's not my money, it's not your money. We know that every good gift comes from where? Yourself? It comes from God. And God has always blessed his people so that they could be a blessing to others. So the money that God has given us, we are to use it to bless others who have a need. And these Corinthians, they had the same objection. And look at how Paul responds. Verse 12. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need. Then there may may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. So when the Corinthians bring up this objection, Paul mentions a few things. First, he says, look, not everybody is going to be able to give the same, right? There's all different kinds of salaries. There's people that have all different kinds of means. But Paul's point is this. You give what you can. You don't have to match somebody else's big gift. If that person has more of abundance, that's on them. You give what you can. But the responsibility is for each of us as family to give. Give what we have. It's not the size of the gift that matters. It's that we are saying, okay, God, this is what you've called me to. You've called me to love my church family, my brothers and sisters. And so when the need comes up, I'm going to give what I can for it so that their need can be met. Then secondly, he wants us to see that the idea is not I give away all my money and now all the saints in our church are going to be driving Bentleys and having houses that we can't afford. It's not the point. It's not what Paul is getting to. What he wants us to understand is this, that in this season right now, the Corinthians had an abundance. And he says, because you have an abundance, I want you to give. But you know what? There may be a season where those saints in Jerusalem have an abundance and you have a lack. And what the saints in Jerusalem will do is in their abundance, they'll give to your financial need during your lack. Now for Kelly and I, our finances, I'm, it may only be our finances, our finances have done this. Anybody else experience that? And what we've noticed during those times where we've had dips is that God has provided for us. We, I did the math one time. Kelly, here's our bills. Kelly, this is how much our income. It's the way it's going to work. But what happened for us every single time we've gotten into one of those, those moments is God has brought the money to us somehow, and most of the time it's been through other believers who saw the pain who saw the financial need and out of their abundance said, here you go, I know you guys are struggling. In the same turn, when God has given us an abundance and people have come and a financial need has come to us, we said, hey, let's give what we can. Not what I wish I could. I didn't give what I didn't have. I gave, we gave what we could and we meet the needs of those around us. And so this is what Paul is saying to our objection of is this going to be fair? Of course it's fair because the church, the family of God should take care of one another because we are brothers and sisters in Christ and we are following Jesus' example. 
And then he mentions about Israel getting manna each and every single day. And he brings it up saying that people of Israel would gather the manna. Nobody had lack. They all had what they needed. Why does Paul bring this up? He wants us to remember that Jesus led us by example. But then he wants you to remember the faithfulness of God, our Father in heaven. And each of us have been brought out of our own Egypt, bondage to sin and death. And through Christ, he's rescued us, and he's bringing us to the promised land, right? We're waiting for the day that either God calls us home to be with him, or he returns. And we're on this journey to one of those two things. And Paul wants us to remember that while you're on that journey, God will not cause you to hunger on the way. Sure, it's not going to be easy. Sure, it might seem like, God, I feel like I'm hungering right now. But God will provide for you. And Paul wants you to understand that no matter what you give, when a need comes up that you can meet, meet it because your Father will take care of you along this journey of being a Christian and one of his disciples. You will make it to your destination. You will have what you need and you will be satisfied along the way. I say again, generosity begins in the home. For too long in our churches, our church family has been struggling financially and they've been ignored. And it's time for each of us to choose today to be an owner and not a renter of our church family. Because it's not, it cannot rely on the few to meet the needs of the majority of the people in here. It takes every person realizing, I'm an owner of this church family. Hollywood Community Church is my home. I need to begin to build relationships with the people around me so that when God brings up a need that I can meet, I will be faithful to meet those needs. And when we do that, we will love others the way that Christ has commanded us to love him. And so my challenge to you today is this. When God brings a need before you that you can meet, meet it. Step out in faith. Yes, you have your own bills. Yes, things come up. Yes, something might happen where you have to pay something extra. But you can never outgive God, people. Sometimes we're afraid to step out in faith. If God says, this is how I want you to live, I'm going to bless you so you can bless others. And if God promises to do that for us, then we should just go and do it. Sometimes we're surprised that God blesses people for stepping out in faith. Here's what he says he will take care of our needs if we go out and do what he says. Do we trust God or not? And that's ultimately the question we're going to have to answer when it comes to giving. Do you trust God with your finances? If you trust him with your soul, you could trust him with your finances. Amen? And if God promises to bless us, then that blessing should overflow from our life to our church family so that they don't struggle, so that we can all chase the same goal, which is to reach our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, I have hope in all of us at HEC. I said that at the beginning of the message, and I have hope in you. And you might say, Brad, why do you have hope? Because I see owners in this place. I've seen it. I've seen God's love overflow from a person's life into somebody else's here at the church. Over the past year, I mentioned a few. Over the past year, a family was in need of a kitchen. They couldn't pay for it. And a couple men from our church said, we are going to do something about that. And they did it. They put a kitchen in for free. Didn't charge a penny. Why? Because God loved them and they loved the people within our church. Another couple, they didn't have money to get food for that week. And there was a few people that said, you know what, we're going to do something about that. We can't let these people not have food. And so they collected money and gave it to them so they could put money, so they could put food on their table until they got that check that they were waiting for. A lady's car was broken, a light was broken, and one of our church members went and fixed it for her and didn't charge her to fix it. These are people being owners, and this is people at Hollywood Community Church doing this. And I'm sure you could come and tell me stories of, hey, this person did this and that person did that. So this is why I'm hopeful. 
Because the love of Christ is inside of us. And because we've been changed, all of us, I needed it too. God has to shake us up and say, remember what the mission is. It's not about you. The mission is about loving me and loving others as yourself. And I take care of myself. We should take care of our church family. And every day, we have to choose to be an owner and not a renter. And here's what happens. When all of us become owners of this place, we will reach the communities in a way we have never seen before. I believe in the people at HCC. I believe in you, every single one of you who is a believer in Jesus Christ. Why? Because you've been born again. And his love will compel you. It will make you see that you should reach out to your brothers and sisters. And I'm going to end with this quote from a New Testament scholar. It says this, When Jesus, for the sake of us all, became poor, we became rich. Now when people who follow him are ready to put their resources at his disposal, the world and the church may benefit, not only from the actual money, but from the fact that when the Jesus pattern of dying and rising, of riches to poverty to riches is acted out, the power of the gospel is let loose afresh in the world, and the results will be what? Incalculable. Church, I believe this with my whole heart, that if all of us chose to become owners of this place and meet the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ, the roof of this building will blow off because God is waiting for churches in America to finally wake up and say, we have a responsibility to own our families and our churches. And when that gets right, we can love the people in the community and each of us will be ready to go out and say, man, what a difference God is doing in me. Look at what God is doing. Look at the love that God has shown in this place because look at how we treat each other. We really treat each other like family. We really treat each other like we love each other. And when the world sees that, they're going to want to be a part of that because this is not the way the world works. The world says it's about me and you can just figure it out on your own. But a people of God who says, no, we are here to do this together. We are here to bear the pain together. And we're going to own the pain the watching world will see. And our communities can be reached. But it takes each of us realizing that generosity begins in the home, the family of God. And when we realize that and choose to be owners, we will see God do things that are incalculable. Would you join with me in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word because it challenges us. Father, we thank you that the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians because it's also a letter written to each of us. We all wrestle with the sin of selfishness and pride, Father. And Father, we all have times where we have little faith in you and we try to hold on to this money as much as we can, but Father, we forget the beauty that your son became poor so that we would become rich and that's our example, that's our pattern. And Father, give us hearts to step out in faith and realize that you have blessed us to be a blessing to others, that we don't allow excuses or objections that we come up with to stop us from loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. They're our family. Father, help us to own their pain so that we can go out together and reach our community for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for every good gift you've given to us, and may we use it to reach others and bless others. It's in your name we pray. Amen.